Welcome everybody. In this video, we're going to take an overview of a web app, essentially an ASP.NET Core API that will be interacting with the Redis instance in the cloud once we publish it. We're just going to take a quick overview what the setup is in order for it to run in the cloud. In the next video, I'm going to show you how to get it all there. Otherwise, I also have a couple of other videos that explain more or less similar things. So you should go ahead and watch that because in the next video, I'm going to be explaining everything. I'm getting Pretty tired of saying the same thing over and over, so go and watch those videos on Docker, etc. Let's go ahead and get started. For the program CS, uh, just a little amendment of the URLs, so it actually works in the Docker. Pretty standard Docker file. I'll just run the .NET publish manually and then execute the Docker build manual as well. I'm not going to set up any CI CD pipelines. Startup, uh, pretty self-explanatory. We're just adding controllers. We have the uh, Stack Exchange Redis. We get the iDistributed cache interface. If we're in development, so if I'm locally, I want to target the local instance. And because I don't have the whole DevOps thing set up, I, as I'm going to be spinning up or creating my instances, I will set the variable in the Google Cloud console. And I also have some uh, three services registered here. We will find out what they are as we go through them. Yeah, uh, they will just be, they're just there to illustrate uh, some examples and some ideas that I want to relay. Other than that, we have the default controller where we have uh, endpoints for interacting with our services. The services themselves, we can take a look and none of them are too big. All of them are very small. And again, I j as I said, they're just to highlight ideas. Uh, and then we have the I distributed cache extension static class. And this is uh, where we will do most of the coding because I distribute cache interface is not very rich, but you can create a lot of bulk uh, around it. Let's take a look. Service one will be the main service that we're using in order to test if the cache is working or not. Uh, we will do a little bit of a delay before creating the car. And I'm essentially simulating read from a database, but a very, very long read. Okay. So let's take a look. Let's do a little bit of an A side reading. We're not going to do a lazy read because a lazy read implies that the caching service is going to read from the database and backfill itself. A side, we hit the cache, nothing's there. We hit the database, we store it in the cache. Okay. So we have the cache dependency injected. Again, it comes from the startup. I watched the second episode if you are not sure how that works. In the cache, we want to go ahead and get async and to string. So it's an integer. We'll just have something at one and we're going to have the value. We'll await, await this and now remember that all of these return byte arrays and uh, for this, I'm going to do get string async and we're going to use JSON serialization. It just makes storing objects like cars. So for example, in my case, I have a car storing a car object and cache a lot easier. Then we want to check if string is null or empty or we'll check the value. That means at this point, uh, it's not inside the cache. We want to preload it from the database. Before that, let's go ahead, return a new. We'll say that it's cached equals true. And let's say the data is JSON serializer, deserialize car and value here and no semicolon. Then we take it from service one, get car async. We just supply the ID, we await on it and we have the car. We then want to JSON serialize this and store this inside the cache. So let's grab the cache, set string async, JSON serializer, serialize car. And obviously the key goes first. So and to string again, we'll await on this. And this is essentially saving it in the database. We can then just go ahead and return a new OK object here. We'll say that it wasn't cached. So we'll just indicate false, but a semicolon here, or actually I'm forgetting a brace. And actually I just spotted that one too many braces there. And for this, I don't need to deserialize a car. I already actually have one there. And yeah, once we return this object, that's when it when it's going to re-serialize re it. We've got that. Let's come back to this endpoint and let's refresh. You will see it's kind of spinning, it's waiting. And that's the five second delay that I have in service one. And once five seconds pass, we essentially get cached false. And then we have the data. We refresh and then it will basically flip to cache true. And yeah, I mean, that's it. If I have a little bit of a, from a query, you can supply int n if you want to play around with it. With it. So if we want to try a value that hasn't been stored there before, we kind of, we just bump up the number. Okay. So we'll have number two here. We refresh this again, this is cached and every next time we get it, it's instant. 
Now coming around to the CLI, let's just go ahead and refresh our memories on how this works. Uh, we can use keys to see all the keys in the Redis store right now. You can see two and one. Let's go ahead and get the value behind one and two. If you remember, it was an HMAP when we took a look at the implementation in episode two. So H get one. And if you remember the field, you can pause the video here and try to remember it. Otherwise it is data. And you can see that the quotes are escaped. This is essentially a string that we're storing here. We can also do the same thing with the number two. So we have Volvo one, Volvo two. And then I'm going to bring up a point about, again, I'm going to remind you about stackexchange.redis. We can use the del command and you can see the first thing we have to specify as a key. And square braces generally means optional. Here we can specify many keys. So in one request, we can go ahead and delete two things. And this is why maybe if you want the more performance option, you cannot do this with this cache. Here you would have to execute two requests to a remote instance. So just keep in mind again, if we just look at all the keys, the other two are gone. So one command, we clear two instead of doing two API calls. And uh, just to take this a little bit further, again, we'll take a look at the implementation. So we are going to go inside Stack Exchange Redis. We'll take a look at the Redis cache and taking a look at the constructor, the connection multiplexer isn't an instance that is getting injected into this library. So it's not like we can uh, have something that we can extract from there. The connection multiple, uh, multiplexer and the cache, the I database, uh, these things are maintained through these connect methods and uh, yeah, connect async methods as well. And this is where the cache gets added, et cetera, right? So just as a point, you do not have access to that flexible tool that is a little bit harder to use, but can do anything you have this very simple interface that you can only interact with the a distributed cache, okay? So with that in mind, let's look at this a little bit further. What we're essentially doing is we're doing get or add. Get a value from the cache. If it's not there, get it from the database. And get it from the database is a little bit specific. Uh, we, what, we, what we're essentially doing is we have something like a factory that creates a value just so happens that the value is being created from, by getting it from the database. What we are getting here with the service too is the same thing. We want to get something from the database and the operation here will be much the same. So we will try to get this string from the cache first and it will fail. This right here is going to be very repetitive. This is something that we want to abstract. So let's just go ahead and copy this into the I distributed cache extension class and uh, oh, let's actually just put it inside the body and let's clean this up. So the cache, the underscore cache, let's first replace it with just the cache instance that we're going to be extending. The next thing that we need is the key and the key is a string. So let's say key, we can say key here replace the next thing here key and then we are get car async we're executing this method realistically as i said this is a factory it, it just needs to create this method so get or add async let's create a function it can accept a key and because we already sort of have the key let's go ahead and pass it into the function okay it doesn't hurt anybody otherwise it's an asynchronous function, which can go ahead and create a type, a generic type. Okay. We want to be able to create a car. We want to be able to create a string. We can we want to create, be able to create whatever. So this has to be a generic method. Let's go ahead, spread this out a little bit. We'll say that this is a factory and then we can go ahead and do this Call factory, pass the key into it. And then we want to rename some of the values because this is no longer car. This is an actual value and this is rather a value string or uh, we can actually say that this is a JSON value, right? You can call it JSON string value. Um, for me, JSON value is fine. But let's import JSON serializer. We want to serialize the value here. We don't have the OK method. I do still want an object to represent uh, the information if it was cached or not, because uh, at an example purpose, uh, I would say if it wasn't this example that I'm building, go ahead and just return the value. You don't need to know if it was cached or not. Okay. So we're going to create a public record. Uh, we'll just say get cached value. 
it will be bool uh, cached and uh, t value so this is generic and then we can replace this with uh, new uh, false and value uh, remove the rest and uh, to actually make this compile let's go ahead and make this task return something like this of type t so this is fine then and we want to do the same thing again this is going to be true though remove the return here and the value json we just want to deserialize this to a t and json value there we go the rest of this can go and there we go so we've ended up with something like this uh, it's not perfect we can um, do things to it to amend it uh, and i mean some of the things will become apparent but essentially all of this will uh, result in being something like this so cache get or add async we pass the key, so n to string. Uh, we can't really use the string value because the service one requires an integer. So we discard the key. It's not too bad. We get car async and we just pass the end. So we uh, we use a closure, right? Uh, this is going to have a result and then we just return the result, okay? So there are ways that you can do to clean this up. Uh, let's pass this here. We're gonna have two. We're going to get name async. It looks uh, something uh, similar. Here we have key though, and get name async accepts a string ID, okay? So the key, we'll pass it here, and we can actually just use it here, right? And pass key and key to here, and because we the lambda function is essentially the same, we can just pass the call to the function rather than executing a function within the lambda. And at the end, just return the result. You will see, this This is nice. This is a little bit like, uh, what can we do to make this a little bit simpler? And I know this is not necessar necessarily speaking distributed cache tutorial. However, when working with distributed cache, you're gonna work with a distributed cache interface in 90% uh, of the cases. And uh, I'm gonna show you how to work with it. Okay, so we have a, a type key which is a string, so we're forcing this to a string. How about if we don't force this to a string, we say that the key can be generic. So we'll have a key, okay, we can't use it, but um, that's not really a problem, right? So this can be any key, and then the actual thing that we want is a key, which is a string. We can take the any key and we can do some uh, switch statements right or you can do if statements uh, wh wh whatever you find easier we can say that this is a string k and if it is a string k return the string k right and that's fine uh, otherwise take the any key and uh, to string it uh, this no longer needs to be a string it can be a var uh, compiler will figure out the keys on their own basically means now we can be a little bit more relaxed on the keys and we can just go ahead and say pass this key in here and we're still a little bit like okay we we have the key here that's being passed in if we hover over it it's still a string we put put a number do we want to use int parse here not really so you know we just take it a little bit uh, further the function that we have here just pass the actual key that we've been passing into it because i mean that just makes sense at this point right so any key Let's come back here and it no longer makes sense to have something like this. We can again simplify it to the same form that we have here. Get or add async, get the key or use this function in order to create it, okay? It can be a function on a service and these are the kind of methods that you can start building up and I would recommend don't try to create these methods straight away. Take steps uh, and implement them twice once you see the repetition, I'd say three times, that's when you extract them. I say, And I'd say if you see the repetition twice, uh, hold off a little bit because it just might be a one-off unless you can use your expertise and say, oh yeah, I can actually see ourselves using this all over the place. Then just, just do it, just do it, right? Uh, let's go ahead and uh, double check that it all still works. We'll refresh the number two. It takes a little bit of time to load, but there it is, cached false, refresh again, and we have cached true, cool. So it is all still working. Now let's go ahead again into get or add async and let's separate this out a little bit because what we're doing here is we have a couple of things mixed in. The getting of a value and the JSON serialization stuff, that is a little bit mixed in into here, okay? 
storing objects using the site distributed cache interface is something that you're going to do if you want to implement C sharp object serialization to byte arrays. Go ahead and do that. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to show you how that's done because JSON is a lot more simpler. So we're going to have uh, the async task. I don't even know if we will have a, a task, but let's first do get async and uh, we'll say get a type T and uh, we don't actually need that. We can have a string key and we can actually do something like this, right? So we have uh, the cache with the JSON value. Let's just grab this interface over here. This is small enough to have it on one line. So we have the JSON value and we can still do this if statement here. We will remove this thing. We'll just return null here. And otherwise we can go ahead and uh, JSON deserialize the T with JSON value, right? This is not astronomically hard stuff. Again, the, this, these are just to give you ideas with what you would do with the distributed cache or because you know, once you have it set up in the cloud, that's cool. Now you actually have to build up the tools for yourself to work with that infrastructure. The null here, uh, the T can sometimes, well, uh, we don't know if it's going to be an integer. An integer cannot be null. So we just say where T is a class, right? So it's something that actually can be null. If you want, you can specify a default value, but make sure your method indicates that. Default value is not the same as null. Null in this case would mean it's uh, missing from the database or sorry, from the cache, right? If you get a null, it's missing from the cache. So now we can do something like get async and specify the type that we're trying to get, which is the T. So now we actually have the value. In our case, if the value is null, we go ahead and recreate that value. We also need the same constraint for the T to be a null. So uh, where t class and then the same thing here uh, we just want the value here so you slowly work up to having methods like these if you're thinking about yeah what about integer there are things that you can do with integers alongs and uh, date times i'm going to show you with the date time one so let's say and uh, well the, the set hopefully you can imagine what the set will uh, look like uh, i don't want to make this video longer than it needs to be so public static async, uh, let's say task, we will say get along async. Again, we'll just copy the same thing. We will make this return along. We can do, actually get do the same here, although we will go to bytes. Just get async key, and we can say that these are bytes. You can call this, the, this value as well. Anyway, we get the value. And at the end, what you do is you have the bit converter and you can convert this to int 64, which is along and Put a value here and uh, this goes both ways so if you want to set long async we'll have your long value set async and then uh, let's remove this uh, this isn't going to return anything and again we use the bit converter with the get bytes and we just put the value in there and super simple we don't even probably yeah we don't need the async here uh, no state machine just return the task and now we can do the same for date time so let's copy this put this here We'll say get date time async. We'll say that this is date time. We get async, we get a value. We still get the int 64. Oh, uh, didn't mean to insert. However, this is gonna be tick. The converter ticks. And in the end, just return new, pass ticks into the constructor. And there you have it. Uh, if you go ahead and say set date time, async long value, value of uh, date time, uh, we kind of do the same bit convert get bytes. We want uh, ticks and uh, var ticks. If you want, you can put this out on, on one line, but yeah, basically you do something like this. You got ticks and then you set async and uh, all, is, oh, all, all is good in the world, right? So you got your primitives, you got your objects. This is how you store them and get them, how you can have a little bit of repeatability of get or add. You can imagine get or default. The imagination is your limit here. Uh, one more thing we're going to take a look at service three. I mean, that's more of a simpler one. Again, if we have the iCache key interface, uh, what can we do with it? Well, if we have something like, let's say, I'll just grab the set and we have set async and we have it for T and we don't need the key here. 
because it's an uh, iCash key and I prefer here because of this because I think I'm not sure don't quote me on this but I think this is no boxing and if you have an interface it does box we return cash set async and we can have value cash key and then just a value and we didn't actually create uh, this interface for uh, uh, this part here so anyway we would uh, do something like json serialize the value here and call set string right so hopefully you get the idea there if you implement something like a cache key and you're basically wouldn't maybe tie your business logic to it but you're kind of saying okay these data types that we're using here they are cacheable okay and making it declared in your code base is fine so the dude is cacheable, we can cache the dude. Uh, let's take a look at what a save function because these are like get or add. What about write a side when we write to cache and then uh, write to the database? What would that look like, right? So uh, we would await, uh, await uh, cache. Uh, yeah, cache, oh, let, let, I don't have the await here. So let's just cache, uh, save async, set async. I think that's what it was. We will just say get our dude here. New, I'll say one. What is it that I had just name? And I'll say uh, Bob. Yeah, Bob is good. I'll say uh, set the dude async, right? So just because we say this is something that we can cache, we just favor, but put the dude in there, right? And that will figure out the key on its own. You can wait on it and uh, oh, let's make this async. How does the service look? I mean, the service save dude async, and we just save it as well and await on this. Uh, so this looks really simple. Now, when you put it in your application, it may not look like that. Again, uh, if you are kind of like, how should I put it? Take a look at the previous episode where we take a look at the strategies and how the comp components communicate. That might give you an idea of what's the best scenario for you. Nevertheless, uh, this will be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you've enjoyed it. In the next video, we're gonna be setting it out all up in the cloud. Don't forget to check the description for all the links. If you have any questions, ask them on the Discord server or in the comment section. Have a good day.